every time I come to the U.S., it just breaks my heart. It breaks my heart what's happening, the division, you know, between whichever, whatever you guys label yourselves with, you know, black, uh, white, African-American, Asian, Caucasian, Spanish, whatever, whatever you, because I get, stop. This is exactly what happened in Rwanda. Hey everybody, welcome back to The Pursuit. I'm Jeff and this is John and we, uh, we're excited you've decided to join us today because we have a guest that's a very dear and special friend of ours. But before we introduce John Gasangwe, our special guest, uh, we first need to talk about our presenting sponsor for today's episode. We're pleased to tell you about Cornerstone Payment Systems. They're a merchant service solutions uh, organization and company that serve this broadcast and serve this ministry in some pretty incredible ways. As a matter of fact, if you go to our website at thepursuitonline.com, there's an opportunity for you to give to this ministry through this platform. And you can provide your credit card. They're, they have bank transfers and wire transfers, all kinds of really cool features that they can provide not only for maybe your ministry, but also for your business. So if you have a need for merchant services solutions, and if you have a company, Everybody does, because you got to take a credit card. Yeah. I tell you, these guys are the group to call. Nick Logan and his team, it's a family-owned business, and they do an amazing, amazing job. You can contact them in a couple different ways. They're on the web, of course, at cornerstonepaymentsystems.com, so check them out there. Or you can give them a call if you'd rather do it the old-fashioned way, <laughs> which sounds kind of funny. Does anyone do that? I, I the, think, the 800 number I think still they, works. Well, right. they do. Okay. Because these guys, are they do business the old-school way. They're very relational. They are relational, no doubt about it. And you can call them at 888-506-0208. Give Nick and the team a call. And here's a cool thing. If you call them and you tell them you heard about it right here on The Pursuit, and you sign up with them, they'll give you a hundred bucks. Hundred bones. You could take your wife or your spouse out to dinner, girlfriend, boyfriend, hundred bucks, nice steak dinner right there, just for using these incredible guys for your merchant service solutions. So check them out. Well, let's get into our uh, our guest today. I'm going to let you introduce John today because that's an honor to be able to it introduce is, John Gasangwa. Yeah. So I'm going to turn that over to you. John is a. We have a very special relationship with you with John Gasangwa. I'm going to let him tell his story here in a minute. But, uh, but man, you introduced us uh, on my first trip over to uh, Rwanda, specifically Bonesa, which is about as far away uh, from the capital city of Kigali as you can get in Rwanda before you hit the lake, Lake Kivu, which, well, it's dark there now, but if you were to turn the camera, you'd be able to see it in the background. Uh, but he is doing an amazing, amazing work. Um, and I, I won't... I, I want to say more about it, but I want him to tell his story because what he's doing is special, but what he's doing because of his story is even more special. And so I really want him to share it. He's become an, an amazing friend and a partner. We've committed to be in Rwanda with him and, and really help him do whatever we can possibly help him do. Uh, we are all in uh, with John and his ministry in, uh, in Bonesa, Rwanda. So John, welcome to The Pursuit, my friend. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Well, John, we would love for you to kind of start off for us uh, today, talking and telling our viewers and our listeners a little bit about the story of Rwanda, because it's a it's a it's a story of great tragedy, but it's also a story of incredible redemption. So, why don't you dive in and just give our viewers the perspective of Rwanda over the last couple of years? Oh, thank you so much. I believe the story of Rwanda, the story of uh, reconciliation. Uh, forgiveness. It's a story actually of resilience of the people. Uh, so for those of you who doesn't know more about, you know, much about Rwanda and the history, uh, in 1994, a country of Rwanda, a very small country in Africa, in East, in East Africa, experienced the worst genocide uh, in the history of mankind. Uh, in 1994, over a period of three months, uh, there was a terrible genocide that claimed over one million people uh, in just three months. It was the shortest genocide in the history of mankind. We lost a lot of uh, men, women, children, uh, infrastructure, the whole country. And a matter of fact, after the genocide, uh, Rwanda was pronounced by the UN as a failed state. 
So there was no hope for this country. You know, we had about 500,000 orphans. We had about um, 250,000 women that were raped to the genocide and, and, and widows. And then, so it, it was a country that has been torn apart. And so, uh, again, the UN and, uh, and all these uh, international agencies saw Rwanda as a failed state. So that's the country that we inherited after the genocide. And I had such a great privilege, I could say, as a little boy who grew up uh, in the orphanage home during the genocide, to see all of this happening, living through this trauma, but also seeing the new rebirth of a country, seeing the reconciliation, seeing the resilience of the people of Rwanda and rebuilding their new country. Now, what happened after the genocide? Well, this is a failed state. It's collapsed. The justice systems are collapsed. People are dead. We have 3 million people that carried out a genocide and they left Rwanda and they're living in Congo. They're trying to attack the country to come and do another genocide. I'm talking about the Hutus. You know, for those who doesn't know, there are Tutsis and Hutus. So in the genocide, the Hutus were killing the Tutsis. So that's the country we had. You know, schools, then the roads. Uh, actually, a matter of fact, the whole country had only $1,200 uh, to run the country after the genocide, the national coffers. So uh, it was traumatic. We didn't know what's going to happen the next day. So that's the country, again, we inherited after the genocide. And, uh, but Rwanda had to make choices, fundamental choices. And these choices were to help it you know, rebuild again. People of Rwanda had to make choices. We had to make choices of how are we going to live? How are we going to rebuild again our country? How are we going to live our differences? How are we going to provide justice to over 100,000 people that have been locked up in prisons for their role in the genocide? No matter of fact, after the genocide, we had over 100,000 people that locked up in the genocide. It would have taken over 200 years to try every single suspect of the genocide to give them justice. So what are you going to do with that? All of the prisons in the country are full. We had, again, a lot of women that some of them, their husbands had participated in the genocide. And then you have the other ones that are widows of the genocide. And these women had to work together because they're the breadwinners. But how are you going to reconcile these two people together and forge that reconciliation and move the country forward? Because we had to start with our people. How do you reconcile a country? How do you reconcile a nation? How do you rebuild people again? So that's the story of Rwanda. That's the story of reconciliation and forgiveness. And so that's the process. So Rwanda from that, as soon as we embarked on that journey, we made a couple of really uh, amazing, amazing decisions. One, we decided that we're all going to be Rwandans, not Hutus, no Tutsis, no Twas. We are all Rwandans. Uh, we changed our national IDs and made them all Rwandans. Rwanda decided to dream big for its people. As the leadership decided to dream big for its people, let's move forward together. We're going to be united. We're going to be more. We're going to look at things that unite us more than things that divide us. And we are going to reconcile and forgive. Now, that's hard. How are you going to give, forgive someone who may be an orphan? In matter of fact, I just met a, a man, a 90-year-old man in my hometown who killed my grandfather and took all the property that we owned as a family way back in 1960. How am I going to reconcile with that person? Well, it's happening in Rwanda. We are seeing perpetrators of the genocide coming out of prisons to ask for forgiveness to the widows that they had carried the genocide in their families. We are seeing orphans forgiving those who killed their families in the genocide. So that's the story of Rwanda. And I believe the U.S. and the world can learn a lot from this country of Rwanda. And that's the story of the country, uh, that we all have the privilege to be part of this country, of the new rebirth of a country, and help the country to get on its feet, to work with these people, uh, to get out of extreme poverty, uh, to work their way up out of poverty through education, through clean water, through all businesses, uh, helping the church rebuild again. So that, and that's what Rise One is doing. 
But that's so, the story, not share of the wonder. So, John, I want I want to um, dig into kind of this story of of um, what your ministry is doing and or what Arise Rwanda is doing. Um, but first, I, I want to take a pause, if we could, kind of again, because many that are going to watch this episode were like me um, before I went to Rwanda. We know a little bit about what happened, and I think your kind of thirty thousand foot uh, tour of of the events of nineteen ninety four um, did is probably very educational for many people. But there was a term that was birthed out of on the heels of genocide that sort of helped to unite the country in the way that you just described. And this term is called Komera. And I think if you were to look at what it means in the Key Rwanda Dictionary in, in, in the English, it simply means be strong. And, and while I think that's true, there's more to that word around being strong, isn't there? Oh, thanks so much, John. Yeah, I mean, when we talk about the history of Rwanda, it's law goes way long, way long back. But let me just give you a recap of this country. Uh, Rwanda was colonized by the by the Germans, you know, in the eight, in 1900. And when the Germans lost uh, to the you know the First World War, Rwanda was given to Belgium, and so Belgium actually uh, was you know given to Rwanda, and all the problems of the division or the hatred was actually studied by the colonial power, that's the Belgium. And then uh, in 1940s, actually the Belgians started to divide the Rwandans along uh, their ethnicity you know, background, Tutsis and Hutus, uh, in different classes. And, and so that's when they started actually issuing the first national identity cards that, that had our ethnicity background, Hutus and Tutsis. So in 1960, we were given the independence uh, by the Belgians, but there was a very uh, a civil war that erupted uh, between the Hutus and the Tutsis, and then 2,000 Tutsis were kicked out of the country and became refugees because they had put in a Hutu president uh, that was, you know, given in, uh, put in, put in by the uh, the, uh, the the Belgian the Belgians. So, uh, so things really never got well even after the independence. That's when my family fled into Uganda from Rwanda. So I was born as a Rwandan refugee boy in the refugee camp in Uganda. And this is such a start of so many other Tutsis that fled the country in 1960. So in 1994, that's when the genocide, the climax of the genocide happened, of killing of the Tutsis. As I said previously, you know, it was, it was planned. It was ide I, I, ideologically planned in churches, in schools, it was taught, uh, everywhere it was taught. So this was something that was going on for over and over, and it was being planted uh, in the next generation of people. So 1994 was easy for a genocide to happen. And uh, there are so many triggers that would happen, uh, uh, but you know the UN and all its international bodies and churches never really did anything to stop it. So, so the word that you're talking about, Comera, is a result of what we saw in the genocide is a result of the resilience of the people. When people come together and they hold hands together and they go, Komera, be strong. It's a word of comfort. This will never happen again. I am your neighbor now. We are reconciling. We are forgiving each other and be strong. So every time you come to Boneza or every time you come to Rwanda, you hear kids everywhere on the hills and the women and the men telling to be strong. Rwanda suffered, but now we are strong. We are thriving together. We are living together. We are forgiving each other, and we are moving on forward together as a country. And that's what Komera means. That word came out of the genocide and made, telling people to be strong, to be resilient, to love on each other and forgive. You know, John, I, I know you know um, the condition that we're facing right now in the United States. Of course, right now you're in Boneza, uh, but you do spend a significant amount of time in the United States. So you understand the political climate that we're facing right now. Matter of fact, John and I just did an episode just a couple of days ago, and we were talking about this issue of division and how the political system that now we, you know, we've always had in the United States, but, but what we've seen really begin to become emphasized over the last months and years is a greater sense of division a greater sense of division where literally these two groups are to, to a point to where there is significant hatred, not just disagreement, 
but hatred between two parties, and it's really beginning to divide our country. And and I and I see, and we and the, kind of the correlation that we drew, John, was that's kind of an empire mindset, and that's what I see that took place in Rwanda with with the with the Belgians that came in and they began to colonize and it began, what they specifically did was separated people. They actually created divide and by creating divide, it gave them more power. And the problem is when they were pulled out of the equation and you guys were given independence, now you had two clashing organizations, tribes that were fighting over power. And it came to this point to where an an incredible genocide occurred. And so I see the parallels between what Rwanda has gone through and what the United States is facing. And I'm not going to come anywhere close to to saying that there's going to be a genocide of this nature in the United States. But the hatred and the division that exists is absolutely paralleled. Let's talk about, or if you could, teach us a little bit here in the United States what lessons specifically we can learn as a nation that Rwanda is now working itself through. Thanks, Jeff. It really breaks my heart uh, to see what's happening in the U.S. And uh, I am married to a beautiful American, you know, wife. Uh, my wife's American, and uh, but uh, America's given so much to me as a nation. You know, I got the greatest education uh, from the U.S. I got an MBA from Colorado State University. And uh, actually, when I was a little boy uh, in the refugee camp in Uganda, I was sponsored uh, to go to school by the American organizations. And so many Americans have actually come alongside to support uh, Rwanda uh, on its journey of recovery. So we have such a great partnership and uh, friendship. And uh, if it was for not America to come after the genocide, it would have been hard for Rwanda to take it off its feet again. But anyways, the point is, every time I come to the U.S., it just breaks my heart. It breaks my heart what's happening, the division, you know, between... Whichever, whatever you guys label yourselves with, you know, black, uh, white, African American, Asian, Caucasian, Spanish, whatever, whatever you, because I get, stop. This is exactly what happened in Rwanda. This is exactly what was happening in Rwanda in 1940s. You know, division, division dividing people. We are all Americans. And so, stop. I would say white people will learn from Rwanda. I would urge you, every American people, all the American people to come and learn from Rwanda. You know, and these are the lessons, you know, they can learn. You don't have to cut another genocide. We've done that. You don't have to hate yourself. You've done that in Rwanda. You can come and learn from this country, but you could also learn how reconciling our differences, how we're forgiving each other, and how we are moving forward as one person. We're all Rwandans, and we are working together, loving each other, supporting each other, and we're calling each other that we're all Rwandan. And that's where the word Komera comes from. I wish that all Americans would love that word. Komera, be strong. We're all Americans. And this is, there's so much that unites us that what divides us. You know, I don't care uh, which political party you're coming from, you're Republican, you're Democrat. It doesn't matter. Because this is exactly what happened in Rwanda. We had so many political parties, the differences, instead of uniting the people, they divide the people. And what happened was the genocide. We don't want to see a genocide in the U.S. We want Americans to reconcile, to forgive, and to move on as a nation. So I would really urge the Americans to learn from the history of Rwanda and how the Rwandan people have forgiven each other have reconciled and are moving on. And we are all Rwandans. And I think Americans should believe that they're all Americans. John, I'm going to ask you a question through a story. And it's a story that all three of us are familiar with because we all experienced it at the same time. But I want to let our viewers and our listeners in on this story. John, you took us to the home of a widow. And I'll never forget this. And we walk into her very humble living room. And we walk in the living room and we sit, there were just a few pieces of furniture for us to sit on. And uh, we walk in and we sit down. The widow's sitting across from us. And there's a small love seat just to the left of me. And there was another couple, a husband and a wife, that were sitting in that love seat. 
And through the interpreters, through yourself and other interpreters, she began to tell her story. And it was the story that happened over and over and over again in Rwanda. And it's a story of these, these tragic murders that took place in, in local communities, right? And as she's telling the story of her losing all of her kids and all of her family and her husband and everyone that was close to her, and she was sobbing, she was weeping as she was telling the story, and we were sobbing, we were weeping as we listened. Um, in my mind, I don't know about you, John, but I'm thinking, who's this couple? Yes. Yeah. Why are they here? Are they here for emotional support mm-hmm. for her as she's telling her story? And they were about the same age. About the same age. Yeah. And then it got revealed mm-hmm. that the man that was sitting with us in the room uh, was her neighbor. Mm-hmm. Grew up together. They grew up together. And it's the very man that killed her entire family. Yeah. And I remember that moment, and it hit me like... <laughs> I, I get emotional thinking about it, and, and it hit me like a ton of bricks in this moment that here's this man that killed this woman's entire family, and they're able to sit in the same room together. She forgave him. They, they tried him and convicted him and sentenced him to 30 years. And we were sitting in that room on the 25th anniversary of, of the genocide. Mm-hmm. And I remember looking at you, and we looked across, and I was thinking, well, good, justice was served in my American mind. And I thought, wait a minute, why is he still, why is he here? It's only 25 years, shouldn't he still be in prison? And it was revealed that, uh, that she had gone with his wife. His wife would, every Sunday, bring him food to the prison. And she decided that this word cometa was so important that it, it was, it was um, asking her whether she would forgive this man that, and, and who had killed everybody. And I think he, she said 70 people in her family. So she went to the prison and he fell to his knees and asked forgiveness. And she stands him up after a conversation and says to the warden of the prison, let this man go. I've forgiven him. And they let him go. So here's my question for you in, in the context of that story. It's probably the same question that every single person that's listening to this right now is asking. What gave that woman the ability mm-hmm. to forgive? Hmm. Well, that's a good question. Uh, I think everybody should be asking themselves that question. And um, I think Tassie, Tassie, and that's her name, and uh, she challenges all of us. If she lost 76 people uh, in the genocide that were killed by Tassier, her neighbor, and she's able to forgive him. Actually, she walked to the prison three times to be able to talk to him and say, I forgive you. And that's how he was let out. So if Tassier, Tassien, that's her name, if she can forgive someone who killed 76 people in her family, what can we learn from that? What, what are you struggling in your life that you can't actually forgive? What am I struggling in my life that we can't learn from this widow now who was able to forgive? And what, what are we holding back? What do we get if we don't forgive? I think those are really fundamental questions uh, we should be asking ourselves instead. But I think for Tassien, is the story of, uh, of uh, why she was able to forgive. It was her faith you know, in God, but also a story of hope for New Rwanda. She wanted to say, she wanted to forgive him because she believed God had forgiven her. And actually, that God had received her life during the genocide. And so she wanted to say, you know what? God extended grace to me and, 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 and forgiveness. I want to do the same thing, you know, living the Bible. But on the other hand, she also wants to give hope to Rwanda, to her children and to Tassian's children, that we are together and we can forgive. And this is the legacy we want to leave back. It's painful, it's hurtful, it's, it's traumatic, but that's the right decision to make so that we can give hope to the next generation of Rwanda. And so she's doing the sacrifice, if you wish, to actually be able to sacrifice 
prize for the next generation. But also something very important is she is the only one that has something to offer. What does Tassie have to offer? His guilt, his shame, whatever he did? No. But Tassian has something to offer, and that's forgiveness. And so that's why she was deciding to choose to actually forgive Tassian for her behalf, the behalf of the children, and for the behalf of the country of Rwanda. So those are the hopes, and that's the new Rwanda we are all creating. There's so many thousands and hundreds of stories like Tassian Tassian, and now they are able to work together. Tassier comes to check on Tassien. Tassier naturally goes to check on Tassier. And uh, they, she, he has been reintegrated in the community with his wife and children. And they are living together again in the same village. And that's the powerful story. In, in fact, I know that it, at this moment, probably, he has come across that little gulch that we were, where we were sitting across the, in the jungle and is serving her taking care of her chickens, her, her goat, her cow, oh, yeah. her cow, yeah. which we're going to get to that because she got that cow as a function of the ministry that John Gasangwa has stood up in, in Arise Rwanda. There is this rising tide of hope, uh, forgiveness, joy, peace, and quite frankly, Cometa that's happening across the country, John, isn't there? And, and you've started an organization called Arise Rwanda. Would you talk about what you're doing um, through this ministry, and you mentioned it already in some of the areas around water and education, but would you talk, just let everyone know what's going on there with Arise Rwanda? Mm. Thank you so much. I think before I really talk about Arise Rwanda, I have to talk about some of my experiences, you know, growing up when I was 10 years old, you know, my mom could not afford to send me to school and that was only $10. And so I, uh, I went outside our little mud house, frustrated, and then I made a prayer. I said, God, if you're real and you see me through school, I would live the rest of my life to serve you and serve the poor. Now, I didn't know what I was praying for. But the next thing I knew was that, uh, you know, I was picked up and then uh, be taken to school. And then, uh, you know, so that's how I was able to complete uh, school. And then I had this wonderful privilege uh, to go to school in the U.S. Now, my dream to the U.S. was, you know, going to the U.S., getting an education, maybe starting a home there, you know, uh, in the U.S., or eventually maybe come back to Africa or Rwanda and start a business and that I can work with the poor because I'm an entrepreneur too and I'd love to see uh, businesses helping the poor people to get out of poverty. So anyway, so I, when I graduated as, uh, as the most outstanding graduate, I had the privilege to come back to Rwanda. I didn't know that God was going to break my heart uh, for things that break his heart in Rwanda. I, I just came for a a business mission trip, if you wish, to Boneza, because I was really interested in coffee. Uh, from Kigali to Boneza, you know, before the good road was put in, it was about six hours, but there was the, some of the most beautiful uh, people, uh, uh, region, but also there's a lot of coffee uh, in Boneza. So it was like great. Uh, I came in here looking for coffee farmers, and then I I was really, really happy that I got to find out there are 1.3 million coffee trees uh, in a small community of only 26,000 people, and they're growing coffee, but they don't have a market, you know, growing what, some of the amazing uh, specialty coffee uh, in the world, but they didn't have a market uh, to sell their coffee. And so because of that, I was like, this is good business for me, you know, to start coffee business in Rwanda, I tried to export it to the U.S., and then I was, you know, working the farmers, learning what their need is and, you know, how can we do business. And so something really, really uh, hit me when I asked the women where they're getting the water. So they take me down the valley, you know, about 30 minutes hike down the valley and there was one broken water pipe that was where everybody was waiting to get water. And then during the summer, dry seasons in Rwanda, women and children would spend all night waiting for her to come in that broken water pipe. Now that broke my heart. That broke my heart. And I asked God, this was too big of a problem. What could I do with this? But, you know, um, it was too much. And uh, I, I said, what do I do? I came for coffee. I came to do business. But then how do you do business with the people that doesn't have water, doesn't have electricity, 
doesn't have education, doesn't have hospitals, doesn't have anything with businesses on the side. And it's really isolated, it's so poor, that's one of the poorest part of the country. So uh, I decided, I felt God was leading me to start a Rise to Wonder, you know, from Isaiah 60 verses one, of Rise and Shine, when I saw those beautiful hills, and then God started to speak to me, and I said, you know, you gotta start, this is why I called you to serve. And so I put everything aside with coffee business and teaching at the University of Kigali, and I actually really uh, took over this uh, vision of studying water wells, uh, education, microfinance for women. And so far, we started with one preschool and a coffee tree, and now we have seven preschool, seven preschools with 400 students or children that would never have a chance to go to school, and they go to school every day, and they also feed them every day of school with one meal. And now we're working with 3,000 women to help them start small businesses, giving them small loans so that they can you know, develop and start businesses. We are covering 90% of this community that didn't have any clean water, only one broken water pipe, with 90% of access to clean water. And we just started a high school for 26,000 people didn't have a high school. And now we have a high school with 250 students that are learning computer sciences, construction, and, and uh, hospital and tourism. So this is the hub of this country. This is the hub of Boneza. And we also are working, you know, we give cows to, to poor families, mostly the survivors of the genocide. And the cows provide manure, they provide milk, and also as a source of income uh, to the families. So we have been really privileged, my wife and I, to be part of a Rise Rwanda and serving in a Rise Rwanda for the last couple of years. Uh, you know, she just, we just got married, but you know, I've been, I've been doing this and, uh, and uh, God has really pri privileged us with such partners like you and Jeff. Uh, you've been such instrumental. When Jeff came the first trip about five years ago, there was nothing. He in Boneza, and now the Holy Hill is shining with such a great, you know, education. The pastors are more united. You know, all pastors from different denominations can come together, get the training, and then they can go back and replicate this into their uh, communities and be able to uh, support their uh, church members and grow the ministries. So. We are reaching out, you know, to the youth uh, uh, through crusades, uh, through conferences, and, and uh, it's just amazing to see what has, God is doing in Boneza, but also the ripple effect that this ministry has caused all over the country. Well, John, you you have done an incredible job. You are um, you are one of the heroes of the faith in my book, and it's amazing story of faithfulness, of of obedience. And you're right. I was there five years ago and you took me on top of that hill that you're sitting on right now. And there was absolutely nothing but a couple of wild chickens and a bunch of bushes and thatch. And he said, this is going to be a high school someday. Mm -hmm. And and now he's sitting in a home with electricity. And as a matter of fact, what's cool, as you know, John, is right behind him is a tower that the electric company installed on top of this big hill. So now that gives us the ability to have some of the best internet in all of the country right here in the middle of nowhere. And that's why we're able to talk to you through the power of technology. Mm -hmm. My friend, um, we are behind you. You know that. We're behind you a thousand percent. For those that are listening and watching here today that want to give to one of many or all of these incredible projects that you have going on in Rwanda, tell them the best way to reach out to you in your ministry, John. Oh, thank you for that. Thanks for asking that. And, you know, thank you so much, Jeff and John, for being part of what God is doing here. I, uh, I feel the privilege to partner with so many people all over the world. And uh, what I'm saying to the people is come, come and see, come and be transformed. I mean, the story of Rwanda is a unique story that will touch you, will transform you. And it's plus a beautiful country with wonderful people. So I would encourage people to come to visit Rwanda. You know, you can uh, organize for teams now to come to Rwanda with you all over the world, all over the U.S. Please come and experience this. Come and get be transformed by the people of Rwanda and uh, the stories of Rwanda. So the best way to get to us is through uh, Arise Rwanda website. It's www.ariserwanda.org. And that's the best way you can, you know, reach us. Or you can contact Jeff and John. 
uh, personally, and then they will, uh, you know, tell you how to get a restaurant or come to Bonesa. And so we'd love for you to come and partner with us. God is on a journey of transforming this country, and we'd love for you to be part of this. So thank you so much. Well, John, thank you for joining us. And everyone, thank you for joining us for another episode of The Pursuit. Incredible stories, incredible men and women like John and his wife and, and countless others that are part of this journey, part of the pursuit of relentless pursuit, I should say, of truth and transformation. And John is a story of transformation, and we're blessed to know him. So, hey, thank you for joining us. Make sure you visit our website, thepursuitonline.com. Check us out. Go on YouTube. Subscribe to this channel. You'll get to hear a lot more interviews just like the one you heard today. Anything else you want to add? Hey, we're going to continue this conversation with John and his staff. There's some incredible things we can learn from. I'm thinking about like Darius and Manzi. And some of the, he's got an amazing team out there. And uh, we are so privileged, so privileged to partner with you guys and very much look forward to the next time that we can break bread together. All right, everybody. We'll see you next time on The Pursuit. See ya.